Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service. Let's all stand and worship the Lord together this morning. We're going to start off by singing Hosanna. celebration for many of us. I'm glad that you're here joining with us either in person or on the live stream. It is good to be with you. I want to let you know of just um, a few uh, prayer items or things coming up, a few announcements here, and then we'll give us uh, a moment to just rest and pray uh, before continuing in our song service. I wanted to let you know 
that um, I am still looking for some folks to help us out with our Advent reading this year. So starting next week will be the first Sunday of Advent. And if you would like to help participate in the morning service, there's a, a little simple reading and then a lighting of the Advent candles. I'd love to hear from you and talk to you about that. Secondly, we're, we are going to go a little bit old school this year, something I've been wanting to do for some time, and it's been a while since we've done it. Um, I am heading up, and we'll see if anybody comes and joins me or not. I think I got two or three that said they would. Um, we are going to go Christmas caroling this year. So we have a number in our body who we have not seen in quite some time, um, who have been shut in since uh, COVID time. And so we are going to make a point of getting out and visiting some folks and uh, sharing some, some Christmas music and some joy. And so on December 22nd, that's the Friday before Christmas, in the evening at 6 p.m., we're going to gather up here. We don't have a church van anymore, so we're just going to do simple carpooling, and we'll figure it out. Um, but we are going to split up and go to a few of these um, homes and just share some, some love and encouragement and joy uh, through some Christmas carols. So if you want to meet with me, uh, we're going to meet here, um, I believe, at 5.30 so that we can head out by 6 o'clock on Friday the 22nd. Finally, I do have a prayer request uh, for this week specifically. I got a, a, a message from James Nicholas who is heading in tomorrow for a CT scan that is follow-up from his, um, his cancer and surgery two years ago. So this is a, a normal follow-up, um, but making sure that there aren't any reoccurrences and stuff. So he would appreciate our prayers with him as he heads in for that appointment tomorrow. I think that's all I have specifically that I've been made aware of. Let's take some time now. I'll be quiet and just let us um, lift up our prayers, our meditations, our hearts to the Lord. And I'll close us in prayer just in a moment and we'll continue in our song service together. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and in the, in the heart of the time of celebration we have just had as uh, an American people, I want to give you praise and glory and offer you my thanksgiving for you are good and holy and worthy of our praise. You have been faithful generation after generation. You have never broken a single one of your promises. You are long-suffering and patient with us. You have continuously sought after those who would have tender hearts, who would respond to your call and return to you in a relationship of love between father and child.
Lord, we thank you for sharing your peace with us that in the midst of trial and tribulation, in the midst of storm, in the midst of unforeseen circumstances that are outside of our control, in the midst of a world filled with uh, corruption, in many cases, with wars and rumors of wars and people living according to their sinful nature, you have given your children a calm, a steadfastness, a foundation of faith that we trust you above the circumstances, that we see a higher value than even that of our own physical lives. Lord, thank you for your transcendent power and grace to us. I pray that you would guide us this morning in your word and on the meditations of our hearts and minds. Even as we sing these songs, may they be more than words on a, on a screen um, that we share together, but may they guide the meditations of our heart that we would worship you, that we would enter into your presence and, and fall before you in, in adoration and humble submission. Truly, God, you are worthy of all we, that we are. We love you. In your name, amen. Let's continue to worship him together. Please stand once again. The splendor of the King Oh, the majesty And all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps Himself Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Oh, 
Starting with me right away, so don't worry. Um, I think I let uh, yeah I let you know last week. Um, we have some guests with us this morning. Uh, Larry and Suzanne Whale, Susan Whale, have been in Mozambique serving for uh, about 23 years. They told me they served there, and they were last here with us. I don't remember the exact date. It was several years pre-COVID. You know how we measure everything like pre and post COVID now? It's kind of a weird new life that we have. Um, so it's been a while for us since we've gotten to hear from them. And not too long ago, I received a call. Actually, I had seen a few updates before that, but I received a call saying, hey, 
we are going to be back in your area and we've uh, been doing some major transition in what we're doing ministry wise and we would like to let the congregation know um, I don't know exactly when it started, but they have been partners with us, or rather we have chosen to partner with them for uh, a number of years, like way back before I came years. Um, so um, back when Jimmy was pastoring here, they were originally launching out. And so they came in those early days and uh, we've been partnering with them in some measure ever since. And so they are here with us just to take a few minutes this morning to share with you what God is doing, what the transitions are, and where they are headed next or in ministry. Um, so I will turn it over to you guys. We're so glad that you are here. Come let us know what's going on. Thanks so much for having us again. We were here uh, the Sunday after Thanksgiving in 2019. And it was uh, a time of preparation for us to be, well, we were speaking and, and raising support and letting people know that we were heading back to Mozambique in 2020. Well, we had our tickets purchased. We had things uh, in our guest bedroom that we were planning to pack, extra Lowry seasoning salt, chocolate chips, brown sugar, deodorant to last for a few years, hearing aid batteries, you know, all those things that are a little bit difficult to get there in Mozambique, which is in Africa. And so we were excited about getting back to Mozambique for our last term before we retired. And March, uh, we were on some trips in March, came back and everything. Remember the arrows in Walmart, you know, where you had to go one way, one direction, and boy, I got... I got reprimanded when I was in the wrong direction, and oh man, it was crazy. We were in Squim, Washington. That's where we kind of call our home. And uh, so we were having to make uh, a change in plans. Now in Mozambique, we always have plan A, we have plan B. We usually have plan C and D because, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And so we're used to being flexible. We're used to making changes in our plans. And so this was something quite different for us. And uh, we thought, well, this is going to end in you know, a few months, so we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll be able to, our, our tickets were still good. They said, yes, you can use your tickets and, until June of 2020. Well, June came and went, and there was no way that we were going to be using these tickets to go to Mozambique that year. And so we contacted our headquarters, which is in Greenwood, Indiana, a little way south of, uh, of Indianapolis. And we asked them what we could do to be a part of the ministry, continue on in the ministry with OMS. And so I was able to start the work in, um, with dynamic women in missions. And it was a wonderful, I, I was the administrative assistant working with the director um, Sam Downey, she's a wonderful uh, woman that has been able to um, work with encouraging women like you in the pews to get out and do short-term missions with women around the world. What an exciting blessing it has been. And so I started something different than, I had always worked with children and teachers, but this was a wonderful opportunity for me. So Dynamic Women in Missions, what they do is they train women in other countries to know who they are in Christ and to give them tools, uh, practical tools, so that they can share the gospel of Christ with their families, with their communities. And uh, it is a two-day training. We use interpreters because, of course, we're speaking English and these are um, you know, different African countries as well as South America and, um, and, and Asia as well. My first uh, dynamic women trip was to India and, and what a wonderful experience it, it was. And the women really, you know, we as women connect easily. You don't have to have some long drawn out plan of how you can reach women. Women seem to just 
know how to communicate well with each other. And so it was something that was not that difficult to do. You go there a few days, you have uh, time to do the training and help them practice, and, and then you can, uh, then it was just so effective. So I dis we did some training on Zoom, and that was a challenge. Thank the Lord for Zoom, but also a challenge to do training with that and trying to figure out how to be able to have them practice and everything. But we did a few of those trainings. One was in Romania. Uh, we did a seminary class for women in Mexico City. And um, I think there was uh, something else in Bangladesh, training for a Sunday school program. Wow, it was amazing. But I did was able to, once finally uh, the traveling opened up and we were able to travel, I took two trips to Mexico, and we've been working in an area that OMS has labeled the circle of silence. And this is an area where there is less than 5% evangelical uh, Christian work there. And it's a, an area that is so, the gospel is so needed. Yet there are churches there. So we're working with women who are already part of an active church and just giving them these tools. And uh, we went to an indigenous area where they, don't e they speak Spanish, but they also have their own language, indigenous language. And what a blessing that was to be able to work with these women. They were so happy to have something for the women because they always have things for the men, things for the youth, but the women never had had any kind of training. So this was great. So I've been uh, involved with this training for four different groups of women. And then we went to Colombia last year, and uh, the country, Colombia. And we did, we trained three different groups of women as well. So it's been a real blessing to be a part of that. And one of the verses that has really spoken to my heart is uh, found in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but God establishes his steps. So sometimes plan A doesn't work but God has a better, much better plan. And so we've been able to uh, really be involved in ministry, even though we weren't in our beloved Mozambique, there were still other areas that we could serve in. So we're just so thankful that God was able to use us even when our plans were changed drastically. I have officially retired from my position with OMS and I continue to serve on a volunteer basis as a special assignment person. So I'll continue to go on these short-term trips. I plan to, I'm hoping, Lord willing, to do a couple of trips to Mexico again and working, training women in a different area than what we had worked with before. And so I look forward to that. And uh, this is just a, a wonderful opportunity to, con to continue serving the Lord. Thanks for your prayers, for your support. We have appreciated this church and, and have looked forward to sharing with you and letting you know what we've been up to. Well, good morning, everyone. You are very fortunate because normally I come with like three or four full sheets of paper to share, and all you get today is this. And, and that could be good or bad, depending on if I can read it or not. But uh, it is a pleasure to be back here again. And... Uh, we love to come down here, and, and I have a brother that's in Salem, and so it makes it convenient for us. And we have not seen my family uh, for over four years. And so it was an opportunity since we moved to Squim in September to be able to come down and spend a holiday here, uh, Thanksgiving with my brother and his kids and grandkids. And so we had a great time of fellowship on Thursday. And so as we think about Thanksgiving, I think I thought of these, these verses out of 1 Thessalonians 5. 16 to 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Wow. Three powerful words. It says, Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Isn't that what Thanksgiving is all about? And we really appreciate you guys that have been partnering with us for all these 20 plus years. And we may not see you more than just once every four years, but even that, we have a connection. We remember those of the past, and we have the opportunities to share of what God's doing in, in our lives. And so I have lots of things to be thankful for, and I thought I'd share a few of them with you. 
First of all, you as a church, because we know that not only do you uh, financially support Susan and I, but you pray for us. And actually the prayer support is so much more important than even the finances. And because Mozambique was not an easy country to live in, and we appreciated those prayers to help us get through the challenges and make those challenges into opportunities. And also for our 28 years of ministry now, and, and we're thinking, my, that's a long time to be away. We left Squim, Washington, where we called home in 1995, and now we've returned back after 28 years to Squim, which we call home again. And it's been exciting for us to come back. Not very many people do we remember. Many have been promoted to heaven, and yet now we have a new opportunity before us to make new friends and new fellowships and work with the church. And also, this last three years that we've lived in Indiana, we didn't know if we really would like Indiana. It's not the West Coast. I mean, there's no mountains. There's no water. Um, it's cold in the winter. Lots of snow sometimes. And yet, you know, God gave us that transition from Africa to Indiana and now to come back um, to, to Washington State. And we loved our three years there. In fact, no one, well, we, everybody there at headquarters says, why are you leaving? Why, we need you here in Indiana. And he says, you know, Washington State, Oregon, where our family is, Canada for Susan, her brothers are in Vancouver, uh, uh, Canada. We miss our family and our supporting church, <clears throat> and they live all close to their families. And so he says, you know, we're being called back. Many people seem to be leaving Washington to Idaho or wherever. Guess what? God is calling us back, and I know he has purpose for that. And so we're looking forward to, th to some of those things. And so quickly what I do, um, I pretty much say I do everything finance for OMS, and I can do that remotely. And I do a lot of uh, spreadsheets and budgeting and expense reports, but I can do all that on my part-time basis, and I appreciate uh, having that opportunity that I learned how to do that remotely during COVID, and now I can continue that um, here uh, on the West. And, and so, and I also have a very close tie with our team uh, and our directors in Mozambique. And I'm on Zoom calls or uh, WhatsApp calls or you name it every week with our directors and our, and our group in Mozambique because I help them with finances and budgeting. And I chair the school board still, Christian Academy in Mozambique, and so you can pray for that. So that's, it keeps me busy. I, I told only us I'm only gonna give you 10 hours a week, but it seems to be a few more than that. And, uh, and so, but uh, it keeps us occupied and busy, and we love being able to get resettled now in, in SQUIM. So my prayer request for you is, or a few of them here, is I want you to pray for the country of Mozambique, for our team in Mozambique, for our school, Christian Academy in Mozambique. They are facing challenges that are so, so difficult right now. And, and we just know that even we may not be able to share all the needs, God knows all those needs. So if you remember Mozambique, just lift them up to the Lord. And, and remember that CAM School, Christian Academy of Mozambique, that Susan was the director for 13 years and I worked in finance all those years. Um, we are turning that whole ministry, the buildings, uh, the property, the, the school itself, everything over to an organization, Christian organization called Teach Beyond. And they have a vision for the future where we don't, we're not there any longer and we don't have any OMS missionaries to carry on with the vis vision of the school. So we are in those negotiations of how we're going to gift all that to Teach Beyond. So pray for that process. It's not easy. You think, oh, it's easy to just give them something. Oh, no, no, no. Everything is very legally binding in Mozambique, and you have to work through lots and lots of processes. And so this is going to be a multi-year process. So pray with me as I direct the board to go through that process. And also, I just wanted to, just as we resettle into squim life again, just help us to feel God's call as to what he wants us to do. 
and as we get involved with our church again after 28 years being gone, and we have three other supporting churches in the area that we communicate with and visit as we can. So um, just help us as we find out what God's call and, uh, for ministry in our local community is again. And lastly, I think just have you pray for um, OMS itself, One Mission Society. They are, we're not young anymore. Uh, in, in 2025, we're going to celebrate 125 years of ministry around the world. And so we have a call, we have a vision of raising up another 125 new missionaries by our 125th anniversary. And so, praise the Lord, we're at 35, 6, 7 that have committed now, and we have a ways to go. But God's going to bring those in. And so pray for our mission as we have to revision ourselves in a very changing society, isn't it, around the world. And so those are our prayer requests and challenges to you. And if you want to hear more, we'll stay a little bit after the service. And thank you, Nathan, for giving us time. And uh, we just appreciate you, and we hope to come back and visit you again another time. God bless you all. We so appreciate the whales and the various missionaries that we get to partner with who are continuing the work of the gospel in various places that maybe you haven't had the privilege of being. Would you pray with me, and, uh, and then we'll look to God's word this morning. Lord, we do, we thank you and praise you for your good work, and that in your, your perfect wisdom, you have chosen to partner with us, to use us in your redeemed ones to go back into the harvest, to go back uh, with words of rescue, with testimonies of what you've done for us and, and see people um, receive that gospel who may otherwise not have any access. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in Larry and Susan's life as they transi transition here stateside and set up home and connect with family um, and, and used to a, a new pace, a new way of life. I pray that you would continue to work through them and uh, make them a blessing to their community, to their families, and to the world Thank you for the years um, that they have freely served you, and I pray that, um, that you would continue to bear fruit through them. We love you, Lord Jesus, in your name, amen. If you would turn with me in your Bibles, um, we are going to be in two passages this morning, in fact, um, what's lifted up there, as per my usual, um, is shorter than what we're actually going to read, because <laughs> uh, I got greedy. Um, if you're following along in the uh, in the discipleship guides, you'll see that um, I'm I'm leaving off a whole chunk this morning, and that's that's on purpose. We're going to do a, a reduced uh, plan this morning. We are wrapping up. Through the fall, we have been looking at the life of Jesus, and uh, particularly during the fall months, we looked at it through the lens of Jesus Christ as prophet, as priest, and now we're finishing up with Jesus Christ as king. And so the title this morning is The Conquering King. I'm not so sure that that's the clearest theme of the passages and what I'm going to share but it's all within that broader theme of his lordship. I want to take a look at you, look at you, nope, I will, but um, take a look with you first at Colossians, Colossians 1, um, and I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 23. And then I want to take you on a journey to the very back of the book, we don't get back there very often. In fact, I notice when I turn the pages in our, in our display Bible, kind of our church family Bible up front, the words, the end, showed up. 
I don't see that very often when I'm reading in the Bible. Um, but we are going to be in the very back, Revelation chapter 22, um, verses 10 down through the end. I want to highlight uh, two main ideas this morning. First, Jesus is the resurrected king who is directing the church. And second, Jesus is the returning king who rewards, he is rewarding the faithful. Here's kind of a, a bit of a poetic way of putting our big idea this morning. Jesus is the king of kings, the one who rules perfectly over his people. Amen? One day, King Jesus is returning for his church and to establish his perfect, eternal kingdom. He's already working to establish it, and he will bring it to fruition. Okay. Turn, me if, turn with me, if you would, to Colossians. Let's dive right in. I'm backing up just a little bit to verse 13. Reading verses 13 down through 23 here. It says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in himself, so he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness uh, to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. We'll pause there. I want to share with you just a, a few thoughts on this subject of Jesus, the resurrected king who is directing the church. First, I want to back up a little bit before that little segment that specifically talks about Jesus as Lord of the church and look at this a little bit broader context here that we backed out to. This idea that Jesus is preeminent. I know you probably didn't plan on going to school this morning. Uh, here's a big fancy word, preeminent. I don't know how many of you use that in your everyday going about. It's a fancy word, but its, it's core idea is it's the top. It's the most important. It has authority. It has uh, position. It has privilege over all others. Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is above all. He has authority over all. Um, here in our text and throughout the New Testament, arguably the old in its own foreshadowing way, but certainly all through the New Testament, all through the Gospels, 
we have affirmation after affirmation that Jesus Christ is eternally one with the Father. They are one. He is one Lord, one God. We see here in our text, and it's in, it's a, in a couple of different places, um, I'm spelling it out from verses 15 through 17. The argument is made that he is the fullness of God, that he is one with the Father, that because of his eternal position, who he is, and because of his obedience to come to earth, to live and to die on our behalf, that he has been given full authority over all things, including the affairs of men, <laughs> um, including our lives and destinies, has been entrusted to his overseeing. He is preeminent. We see here then in verses, we'll zero in on verses 18 through 20, that Jesus in this passage is being described as he is about his work. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is not cooperating with me this morning. He is about his work. And what is the work being described here? It is the building of the church. It describes here that Jesus is the head of the church. Again, that idea of preeminence, the one who is in charge, the one who has full authority. In, this, in other places in the New Testament, it even refers to Christ as the builder of the church. He is the sustainer of the church. Um, the Son, working in conjunction with the Spirit, empowers and enables the church. He, has, he sets the vision and the plan for the church is an extension of his own redemptive work and actions. We cannot redeem people ourselves. That is not what I am trying to say. But because he has already done the work, we get to hand out invitations. We get to go visit with people and introduce them to the good news that Jesus has come. God himself has made himself known in the flesh. He has told us of his love. He has told us of his plan. He has called us to receive from him the gracious gift of eternal life and a change of person, a change of being right now in our very nature. He is about this work. Is he just building the church to have a bunch of numbers to count off like we strangely do as some sort of... Uh, a just an exercise of, hey, the, the margins are getting larger, our, our statistics are looking better. No, look at the motivation that is told here, told us here. Why is he, rebuilt, re, why is he about the work of building the church? Because his mission is to reconcile the world. That has always been his mission to bring back, to call back, to restore, to fix that which was lost and broken from the very introduction of evil in the garden and continues to, um, to, uh, to sicken, to spread through mankind, um, that of evil. He desires to reconcile us, to bring us back into right relationship with himself. Not as, um, okay, so I'm going to say some things this morning to, to challenge us a bit. Um, it is consistent with the evangelical doctrine of what we believe, but it may challenge us a bit. Jesus did not just come to forgive us of our sins. 
He did come to forgive us of our sins. Hallelujah. He came to set us free from sin and to empower us to live a life with him that begins now in cleanliness, in purity, in a, a whole different way of thinking and acting and continues into eternity. I think you're going to hear those themes in that message through these two passages. We see that here. He, is, he has come, he is about the work of building the church and through the church continuing his work of reconciling the world to himself. Verses 21 through 23 speak to that uh, last point a little bit further. I put it this way in the notes up here. The testimony of God's lordship is the sanctified life. Uh, look at those verses with me one more time, just for some clarity. It says, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, Paul is writing to the believers in Colossae, the church in Colossae, and he's saying, you know what it is like to be a part of the world. You formerly were in that way of mind, uh, in a rebellion and disobedience to God, alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body, so this work of reconciliation that Jesus is about, they have experienced it. That's what they testify to, that God has done this work for them. goes on. Um, he's reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Sometimes we forget this theme through scripture, that God desires to make us a holy and blameless people above reproach. That's not speaking to our personal power or our um, uh, self-made goodness. It is speaking to his design and his power that Whatever this is, this power that he has um, secured, that he has demonstrated, that he has displayed on the cross over sin, it is more than just a quick forgiveness of bad behavior. It is power over the entrapment, the clinging, the... Um, the sickness of sin itself within our lives. The claim is that through faith in Jesus that he can actually make us holy before God. And this is a beautiful picture. Now, it's not what's in the text, so I want to be careful here. It conjures in my mind that first wedding in the garden where we're told that God presents Eve to Adam, right? And Adam was like, woohoo, this is great, right? Look at this. He, <clears throat> let me get to it. In order to present you holy and blameless and beyond reproach indeed he desires to present us to the father look these are the ones who have responded these are the ones who have uh, to use the same metaphor who have accepted the ring who has accepted my proposal this is my bride. These are the ones who have entered into the relationship. Look at them, spotless and beautiful. 
It gives us a warning in verse 23. It says, if you indeed continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. It's a warning to watch out, right? To be careful, to be watchful. There are false teachers. There is a propensity to get lazy, to wander away. Um, in, <laughs> to use the, the metaphor I was using before of human relationships and weddings. If we forget to communicate, <laughs> if we shut down, if we get busy with just our own personal focus and we neglect our spouse, what do we expect to happen in that relationship? It dulls. It grows distant. Heaven forbid, over long periods of time, it gives way to temptation and maybe even destruction. Uh, this is not in the notes. Um, at our annual conference, uh, one of our speakers uh, was speaking of a pastor friend who had stumbled and fallen in moral failure, uh, sexual uh, failure, and uh, was asked, when did this all start for you? And thankfully, there's been restoration in that relationship, and that person is walking with the Lord and, and has been graciously restored. Um, when it was asked, when did that, when did all this begin for you? Can you identify the beginning of the slippery slope? He said, oh yes, I know exactly when it began. It began the day that I stopped reading my Bible and praying. I don't offer that as some magic potion, you do these, you know, fancy things. But we know that when we grow lazy when we pull away from the Lord, when we look to our own interests and our own focus, there is a slippery slope. There is a pulling away. He warns us, be careful, and if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established, don't walk away from the hope and this gospel which you've heard. Okay. Jesus is the resurrected king, and he directs the church. Now let me take you all the way into the book of Revelation. We don't get there probably as often as we should. If you would turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter 22, the very end here, wrapping up. And I can't help myself, so I'm, I'm backing up to verse 10, and we'll read down through the end. We read, and he, which in this case you might remember is, is an angel who is escorting John around as he sees this revelation. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the church, for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. 
I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Just a few notes here. These are, uh, are fairly broad. Here at the end of Revelation, Jesus speaks of his return and his plan to settle accounts with mankind. I know that's a broad statement there, settling accounts here. Um, He speaks, uh, verse 12, we move to Jesus speaking, and he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Uh, I know that there are those who speak heavily as to rewards mentioned in the Bible and have a whole uh, systemology of what those rewards are and how they're gained. That's not my point this morning. My point is not to try to explain all the minutia, but rather that Jesus promises here that he is faithful. He is going to fulfill his promises to come, and he is aware of the condition of each one of us. He knows your decisions. He knows the, um, your chosen destiny for your eternal life. He knows how you have invested yourself. He knows your sacrifices. And he knows perfectly what the appropriate rewarding and peace and what heaven will look like for each one of us. I think it's interesting here, before we see it switch to Jesus speaking, we have the angel speaking. And he says what, to me, it took me some study. Um, I cheated and read a whole bunch of other commentators first, and they were all in agreement. So then I thought, sat down and thought, okay, how do I work through this? The angel in verses 10 through 11, which, by the way, is not in your study notes for the week. I put them in because I'm a glutton for punishment and felt like we needed the context. He says these interesting statements do not, well, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for time is near. Let the one who does evil, do, uh, continue to do evil um, and wrong and be filthy, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still uh, keep himself holy. What does that mean? Some of you are smarter than me, and so you're ahead. That's great. You, uh, you get gold star for that. In studying this, this, this phrasing, this, um, this set of phrases here, in connection with the context of Jesus, of wrapping up the revelation of Jesus Christ. How many of you knew that was the full title of this book? Okay. By the way, it tells us that at the beginning, in case you're wanting to check me. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. The showing us the last chapter, because where we left off with Jesus on earth seemed sad. He was leaving. He seemed, some would suppose, as a a, um, uneffective king, a failed conqueror, right? And we have revelation, and the Bible says, no, 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 that's not the end of the story. (laughs) No, that's part of the plan, and he is coming, and he is victorious, he is the conqueror. Now, this is at the very end, and one of the last things that we're told is, be clear, at this point, the fates 
are sealed. The decision is made. Those who have chosen evil, that will be their continued state forever. Those who have chosen goodness and righteousness, that will be their reward, their eternal state forever. It is done. It is a big period at the end of the sentencing. Okay? That's what's going on here, is at this point, it is all done. He says, church, look forward to this. I am coming quickly. There will be a time when the sentencing is done and the struggle and the fight and the the feeling disenfranchised of, wait a second, this world doesn't seem right. Isn't this what good is? And the world increasingly saying, no, 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 we're going to redefine it and say that the opposite is what is good. No, there's a time coming when it will be done. There is a sadness to that. There is an awesome fearfulness to that, for sure. But there must come a time when it is done. I better get back to my notes. Verses 14 through 17, those who love Jesus prepare and long for his return. And actually, I think we even get a hint of that there in verse 11. But let's look down at 14 through 17. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter by the gates into the city. This connects to the Colossians passage. God desires to present us pure and holy and above reproach. But look at what it says. And this is not the only place. This just happens to be the one that we're looking at today. Blessed are those who what? Have washed their robes. There's a participatory part in this. God does not work outside of our will. He gives us power to change our will to partner with him, to be in harmony, in step with him. Those who are entering in here, what? They are those who have washed their robes. They have done the work. I use that very carefully. I do not mean work in the sense of what James fights against. Um, Sorry. In, In the sense of doing good works to secure our salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. These are those who have put aside the old self. In Romans 12, we read of they have been crucified with Christ. They take up their cross daily, right? There is a partnership. There is an empowering by God to, for us to climb onto the sacrificial table and willfully say, I am done with this old self. Do away with this filth, this, this brokenness, this, um, <clears throat> this delight, <clears throat> this appeal and attraction to sin. Cleanse me, Lord. Make me holy like you are holy. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the adult, uh, uh, idolaters, adult, yeah, idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. And you could add details to that if you want to, but it's a pretty thorough list. Again, the context here is we are at the very end. The sentence has already been declared. 
This is not making, this is not a permission to us as believers to make fun. To say, ah ha ha, see I'm better or I'm okay because I feel like this morning I interpret myself on this side of that line versus those who are on the other side. And look, they're dogs and they're bad people. The point is not to make fun. The point is one of sober realization. The gate is narrow. And few are those who find the way. We come through a time of thanksgiving. Be thankful if your heart has been tender to heed the call of Jesus Christ. And be compassionate and passionate about extending that good news to others. Because there will come a time when this period is put on the sentencing. And while it is okay for us to recognize the joy and the blessing of that struggle being over, we're not at that place yet. And so we ought to read this as in, I would pray that in every spirit-filled life, that there would be a fire within our bones for our brothers and sisters who do not yet know the peace and the freedom and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Because the hour is drawing late, and I'm not, I'm not trying to preach to you some certain time. It hasn't been told to me. Jesus said it when he was here. It wasn't even told to him. Only the Father knew at that point. I'm not trying to preach something specific other than we ought to have a passion for those who do not yet believe because there will become a time when the gates are shut and there will be no more entry. Finally, God's plan for reconciliation. Um, this, I admit, this is... Um, This is a new thought in connection with this passage. It's not a new thought in in the world. It's a new thought in connection with this passage for me. But when I read through the the last part again, which again wasn't, wasn't in our original study plan today, I've read through this many, many times. I hope you have too and enjoyed the encouragement the admonishment that is here in these final verses to, to not, well, we're told earlier by the angel not to seal up the book, but then we're told here, you know, uh, not to change anything that's here, to make it freely available. But in living in these days, um, In my estimation, there seems to be a great apostasy within what has been known as the church of God. And I am not trying to preach condemnation on any of my brothers or sisters. I'm not going to name any names or any of that kind of thing this morning. But there is a movement within churches, just like ours, gatherings of people who, who claim Jesus to change the story, to reinterpret. And the biggest popular one right now is to to say, the Bible is really nice and there's some good moral stuff in there, but it's nothing more than metaphor and allegory. It's good moral ideas. And, you know, there's things in there that are, are fantastic and wild and beyond the bounds of science, beyond the bounds of rationality. And so, you know, you just kind of have to take it all in stride and look for the moral point underneath it and what's good for us, what's beneficial. Do you understand that that really is a huge wave 
sweeping inside the walls of the church right now. That is not what this is. I think Jesus speaks very clear, clearly to that right here as we're ending up Revelation. This is not moralism. This is not a metaphor to be reinterpreted or, or just taken lightly. <clears throat> this is the very promise of God for eternal life. If that's true, then I would echo the question. Uh, he's long since passed away now. But one of the leading Christian philosophers of our day, Francis Schaeffer, who asked in his famous book, How Shall We Then Live? What do we do? If, if this is the soberness of the end of the story, I hope as Christians here this morning that, that you take strength in knowing and having the end of the story available to you. A lot of the things that we experience in this life would be much harder to handle. They would be confusing and unknown to us. And indeed they are at times. But how much more so if we did not know that Jesus had promised to return to reconcile us to him and to restore, to reward, to fix all of the injustice and wrong in his perfect way, to bring us into full, right, eternal relationship with him. How shall we live? Believers, we ought to live with one eye to the sky. I mean that figuratively. We ought to live with a, a robust, a full faith assurance that Jesus' word is true and he is coming at just the right time, just as he said. And so all of the values that he proclaims, the things that he says are important, the actions that he affirms and says, this is how you should apply your life. These are the goals. These, this is um, what is lasting and of value. This is how you should invest yourself. Don't wait. Don't put those off. Don't expect some mega explosive change where all of a sudden you've got the money or the free time or the perfect energy or the perfect body that cooperates with you or those kinds of things. Don't put it off for some fanciful idea. <laughs> I've been in, I won't try to throw them under the bus, but I've been in <clears throat> observing my own life in my own household this week. <laughs> and, and I don't mean this as a condemnation, just a, an interesting tie-in. It's amazing to me how much of this current generation's world is, is very virtual. I'm not speaking against technology and all those things that you hear railed against. I just think it's very interesting how many distractions are available to us from anything that is real life that actually impacts real people in real ways for a real eternity. Don't get sold a bill of goods 
and put a bunch of energy into the stuff that doesn't last. Discern, sift, weigh, mine, explore, look for what is real and true and a part of God's work because that work will last eternally. Another place of the New Testament says our lives are but a vapor and I don't mean that to be downhearted or sad today. If that's true, then not in the Hollywood version, but in the most real sense, make the absolute most of this life that you have been given. It is worth investing in the eternal life to come. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord Jesus, I don't know if this sermon is for anybody else today, but I know that it was for me in preparation, and so I'm thankful for your spirit of conviction. Lord, as we uh, sit with your word and with these sobering thoughts, Lord, may they stir within us. May they not... um, May they not be allowed to become just some some endless or pointless turmoil within, but rather that they would give way to the empowerment, the, um, the vision of your spirit that you would Take the tension, the discomfort that we feel and turn it into meaningful action. Not just busyness, not just trying to do something more, but that we would be motivated, emboldened, impassioned to serve you with with freedom because we are not afraid of what can be done in this life to us or to this world, but rather that we are looking to your promises that you have a, a bigger, a more complete plan than just these short years that each one of us have been given to invest. Lord, may we invest them well. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In your name, amen. You are dismissed. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever.